Hey guys, it's good to see you guys at the, in the comforts of your guys' own home. Uh, my name's Charlie, I'm one of the pastors here, and we want to welcome all of you guys to our worship here today. And we hope that you guys are blessed and encouraged by our time of singing, of listening to the word, and afterwards when we break up into our small groups. Well, I'm going to go through a couple of announcements, so if you guys could find your way to the YouTube description and click on the link that will take you to our bulletin, I'll just be taking us through some of the announcements for this week. I want to first welcome all the newcomers here. We don't know how you guys found this link, whether it's a YouTube algorithm or your friend sent you this link. Uh, we're just so grateful that you're here and we hope that you stick around and get to know us as a church and us as a body of Christ. And yeah, we would love to get to know you too. So my contact information is in the bulletin as well. So please give me a, an email or a text and love to talk to you guys and tell you more about Jesus and about our church. Our next announcement is we want to congratulate our graduates for the last week and uh, yeah we want to take some time to recognize our graduates uh, from high school Nathan Chung, Isaac Han, and David Lee. So hey so proud of you boys you guys did good work and congratulations for your guys' big accomplishment. Be sure to show them some love in the YouTube comments trusting you guys are doing that. I want to also encourage you guys to come out to Friday Night Worship. Friday Night Worship is an opportunity for us as a church to gather together, but not just as the body of Christ or the family of God, but as well with our nuclear family. So this is our opportunity to worship together with mom and dad and our siblings and an opportunity for us to grow all together. So look at the link at our main webpage, gsch.org on Fridays at around 5 p.m. And uh, yeah, if you can, go ahead and do the lesson together with them. Again, our Sunday online worship starts 1125. Love seeing you guys here and chatting with you guys uh, early on, getting to see how your guys' weeks are. So hope to see you guys at 1125. We start right at 1130, so please try to make it out at least by 1130. Next is our Sunday night prayer meeting happening every Sunday from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, like I shared in the sermon last week, it's been a rich time of us diving deep into the Word and specifically the past two weeks just praying and crying out to God for all the injustice and sadness that 12 to 13 million uh, people living in America, the black community, have, have to face. Um, and so we hear their cries and we want to weep with them together and yeah, we want to pray for real change and we don't know exactly how that change will look like and what even may, we may even disagree with what that change should be. And so this is more uh, opportune time than ever to take our cries and our petitions to the Lord. It's been a sweet time for me, not just as a pastor, but as someone too, wrestling with issues of injustice, issues of what the next step is, issues of what the Christian response is. And so I hope that you guys join me together as we pray uh, for that topic, as well as other individuals within our ministry. So look out for that. Hope to see you guys there. Lastly, our Wednesday Youth Night has become Thursday Youth Night. And so that's, that's not because Thursday Youth Night is catchier. We just actually record Wednesday night, so we're incapable of having Youth Night on Wednesdays anymore. But hey, just wait one more day. Uh, good things happen to those who wait. And we have Thursday Youth Nights happening every Thursday starting next week from 7 to 8 p.m. Hope you can join us for that. At this time, we're going to begin our worship with the call to worship. The call to worship, again, is a reminder for us to see the inherent glory and beauty of God and for us to respond now in worship. So if you guys can read with me Psalm 145, verse 18, we'll say this psalm together. Here's the reading of God's word. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Amen. As we close our eyes and bow our heads, as we prepare for worship, let us remind ourselves that we worship the God who desires worship in spirit and in truth. Let's pray that we would give acceptable worship to our God here today. Let's pray. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. 
Where streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name When I'm found in the desert place Though I walk through the wilderness Blessed be your name And every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in, Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name And every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Let's sing that You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. Yeah, we worship you and we praise you, Lord, because you are faithful through every season, through every circumstance in our life. And so, Father, we turn to you because, God, we know that you're consistent, that you love um, and are faithful to those who love you. And so, God, we put our trust in you during these times, and we place our hope in Christ. God, would you give us peace during this time, and would you help us to live holy lives that display the gospel to those around us? Would you be glorified through our lives? Would you be glorified through our singing now, God? We praise you, Lord, because you are worthy to be praised. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. get tired, we can't win, we were dead in our sin, but there's a hope, a new life, the pressure's off, cause Jesus Christ alive, so we can rejoice though we're grieved by various trials for a little while, cause a genuine faith under testing Brings honor and glory to our great King By God's great mercy we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive Our living hope is in our inheritance Because Jesus
Jesus Christ is alive oh, We don't have to bear the load and We don't have to have control We are free from guilt and shame Cause when he rose, he left death in its grave So we can rejoice though we're grieved by Various trials for a little while Cause a genuine faith under testing Brings honor and glory to our great King By God's great mercy we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive our living hope is in our inheritance Because Jesus Christ is alive No grip of fear, no sting in death By His mercy we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive No grip of fear, no sting in death Because Jesus Christ is alive We're free from guilt, we're free from shame Because Jesus Christ is alive We're free to live for Jesus' fame Because Jesus Christ is alive By God's great mercy we have been born again Jesus Christ is alive Our living hope is in our inheritance Because Jesus Christ is alive No grip of fear, no sting in death By His mercy we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive God has done. He redeemed us with His blood. We were lost and dead in sin. He came for us. Look what God has done. He adopted us in love. We were orphans without hope. Now His children. Are we that He would save us? You are we that He would send us to God be glory through Christ our Savior's church through all generations. To God be glory Through Christ our Savior's work Forever and ever Look what God has done Through His sacrifice for all Sinners unified by grace Bound together Look what God has done By His Spirit through His Son By the power of His hand He is sending And who are we that He would save us? Who are we that He would send us? God be glory through Christ our Savior's church through all generations to God be glory 
through Christ our Savior's work forever and ever lift your hands and praise him see his great compassion see his mercy for us raise your voice and thank him see the church he's building see the lost he's saving look at jesus christ he redeems his precious bride by his costly sacrifice we're invited see the wisdom of his ways in the mystery of grace in every age and every race we're united and who are we that he would save us who are we that he would send us to God be glory through Christ our Savior his church through all generations to God be glory through Christ our Savior's work forever and ever Heavenly Father, we take a look and we witness, Lord, your marvelous works. God, we know that even the church, Lord, is built and joined together, Lord, through Christ and through your work. And so, Father, we want to worship you and we want to praise you, God, because you're worthy. Lord, you've been working and you've been using us and redeeming us for your glory. And so, God, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your plan for your glory. Lord, we pray that as we listen to your word now and as um, Pastor Charlie preaches, Father, would you um, speak through him, Father? And God, would you um, speak to us, Lord, and would you open up our ears to listen? God, would you open up our hearts to receive and understand your word? And God, would your word and would the, through the spirit transform our hearts, Lord, so that we would be witnesses of Christ to those around us so that we would exemplify and magnify his name, Lord, through all that we do. And so, Father, um, would you bless us? Would you help us to follow you, to live for you, and to uh, pursue righteousness and to pursue your holiness, God? We praise you, God, and we um, commit ourselves to you in the service, Lord. We thank you again, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want you to think of these four people, and I want you to think about their attitudes towards church. There's a, there goes by a name, there goes by a guy named Personal Percy, and Personal Percy believes that it's all about his personal relationship with Jesus. He doesn't feel the need to attend church at all because his worship to God is personal. He listens to worship music, and he listens to sermons online, and that's enough because his relationship with Jesus is a personal one. He doesn't need the church. Then there's a girl by the name of Campus Ministry Cindy. Campus Ministry Cindy loves her Christian campus ministry. She's a leader there. She has great relationships there. She's really having some great accountability and Bible reading with people on her campus ministry that meets Wednesday on her college campus. Her schedule is so filled with campus ministry stuff, evangelism here, leadership training here, one-on-one -on -one discipleship here, that by the end of Sunday, she feels too burnt out to attend church. She goes to campus ministry, she's active there. Isn't that enough? There goes by a guy named Pick and Choose Patrick, and he likes the things that the church could give to him. He loves playing basketball with the guys every week at the church gym. And he loves the people that he plays with. The people seem genuinely nice. He doesn't care so much about coming on Sundays, though, unless the topic really interests him. 
Then there's Sermon and Split Sally. And she always makes sure she sits in the back on Sundays. She avoids the uncomfortable greeting time that's there. And right when the sermon ends, you could tell that she is the first one to leave. She doesn't see the point of joining a church, of making relationships there. Just as long as she gives her worship to God, her $1 bill to God, and listens to a sermon every single week, she thinks that that's enough. Now, what do these four people have in common? I think they would all see themselves as Christians, but they see the church as being extra credit to their faith. Now, is that right? Is that right to have a relationship with Jesus and not have a relationship with the church? I think from listening to these four examples, I think a lot of us would confidently say no. But have you asked yourself why? What are the grounds and reasons why that this is so wrong? What's wrong is this, that the local church is not extra credit to our faith. The church is essential. And we show that the church is essential, which is the series, our series title, that we show that the church is essential when we are members of the church and not just simply attenders. I want to talk to you today about the idea of church membership and how it's essential for us to have a right relationship with the church. How do we have a right relationship with the church? It's when you and I become members of the church. Now, what is that? Well, let's start with the definition of what church membership is. And you probably haven't heard this idea before. Maybe you have never heard a sermon about this before. And so you're wondering, I could see why preaching is essential. I could see why uh, worship is essential. But how can something that is not so much talked about inside of the sermons on Sunday, how can this idea of church membership be essential? Well, listen to the definition by a pastor by the name of Jonathan Lehman. He says this, Church membership is a formal relationship between a church and a Christian, characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of a Christian's discipleship and the Christian submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. Well, I know that sure is a mouthful, but let me summarize it like this. Church membership is when a Christian is committed to a local church in a formal, structured way. Well, what does that look like? I found this illustration helpful by that same pastor, Jonathan Lehman. Do you guys know what an embassy is? An embassy is a building that represents one nation inside of another nation. It declares the embassy its home nation's interests to the host nation, and it protects the citizens of the home nation living in the host nation. The embassy is able to recognize who belongs to the home nation. Does everyone inside the embassy belong? Uh, no. It is only those who are the members of the embassy. So who belongs to the home nation? It's not just simply everyone that attends the embassy. It's those who are the members of the embassy. And church membership is important because it distinguishes which nation a person represents. So if the church is like the embassy, we're here, we're here to represent the kingdom of God, right? We are not at our home nation, we're in a host nation, which is this world, not just America, but this whole world. And we belong to another world, the kingdom of God, which is coming, but we have a small glimpse of it right now here inside of the church. We function like an embassy. We're inside of a host nation while we long for a home nation there. And so inside of this home nation that we have, we get to distinguish who represents the whole nation versus who represents the host nation. Inside of the church, the church who are church members who are, or the church people that, or the people who come to church who are members, they represent that our kingdom is not of this world. We're living here in this host nation right now, the world, but we really belong to our home nation, the kingdom of God. Our values, our lives, our mission, doesn't reflect the world that we live in, but rather the home nation, which is to come. Church membership gives us the opportunity to distinguish who represents the home nation and who represents the host nation. And by that, that's why membership is important. It makes that distinguishing mark which kingdom we belong to. 
Now, how we do it inside of our English-speaking site in Good Stewards uh, Church, we have a formal application process. If you want to be a member, you have to fill out this application. You have to go through five or six classes. There's an interview in the beginning as well as the end. One of the hard parts of the ending is you have to share the gospel and you have to make sure that you share it right. You have to confirm that you believe in this gospel that you shared. And through just a series of just different interviews, the application and the classes, if you check off all the boxes, then the church that we belong to, Good Stewards, uh, allows you and uh, allows you to be introduced as a member of our church. And that's how we distinguish, hey, you belong to the home nation. You belong to the kingdom of God. And that is your formal representative way for you to uh, express that, again, in a very formal way. And so you're thinking to yourself, man, that seems very structured and formal. Man, why, why do we need to go through something like this? Why go through all the hassle and jump through all these hoops and becoming a member well, I want to share with you, it's because we go, we do these things because the structure of the things that we do, the formalness of what we do, brings out the, um, the foundations and the shape of the relationship that is to form. We go through this formal structured process of becoming a member because it allows for us to have the right relationship with the people that are inside of the church. This isn't simply a label or a ceremony that we give to people, but this process that we do brings you into the family of God. The structure gives support for the relationship. A pastor friend of mine details his story of adopting his daughter. And there's a lot of structure that he had to do, a lot of formal paperwork that he had to do. He had to go through his own interviews with his wife, and he had to even go to court to be able to fight for the right to adopt uh, his daughter. And all of this obviously is a headache and so much money and time and effort. But the heart of behind it is, you know, our system wants to make sure that the parents are good candidates, that they don't have a criminal history, that they would allow for this, whoever that they're adopting, that they would allow for this son or daughter, whoever they're adopting to really thrive. And so you can't just adopt someone just out of nowhere. You go through lengthy paperwork, interview, background checks, go even go to court just to make sure that you are the right fit. But the process at the end, and this is what my friend told me, he gets so emotional when he thinks about going to court the very final time where the judge was going to decide whether he was going to allow, uh, allow my, my pastor friend to adopt his daughter or not. And with one swing of a gavel, he declared that my friend is now in legal custody of this daughter, his, his daughter. Basically, that he's her new dad. And that's when all the structure, all the different formal processes that they had to go through was all to culminate in that one moment so that they could have an official relationship, that they could be mom and dad and she could be their daughter. You see, the structure is necessary to be able to be brought into the relationship. That is what adoption teaches us. And that is the very foundation of what membership is supposed to do. We see that it is through church membership, it gives the structures and the foundations of bringing into us into, or bringing the family of God together into a relationship. And so that's the reason why, and that's the beauty of church membership. But you may be asking for yourself here today, well, where is it in the Bible? That seems like, you know, that seems to make sense if the church is an embassy and we want people together and, you know, we have this process to, to distinguish who belongs to what kingdom. And once you're there and you know who you're with, yeah, okay, that seems to make sense, but is it biblical? And that's our second point here today. Is membership biblical? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Hebrews 13, 17, in your New Testament. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. It's a short verse. 
We'll see how biblical church membership is. Here now the reading of God's word. It says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. Amen. The sense of reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write his eternal truth upon our hearts here today. Now, as we read Hebrews 13, 17, there's no verse where I read about membership there. So you may be asking yourself, well, where is the verse about membership here? Well, let's ask us this as we take a step back from this verse. The verse is telling us to obey your leaders and submit to them. But who are our leaders? Is it every single Christian leader that's there? So if a pastor from Good Shepherd's Church is saying to you that you should do something and live in this way, are you supposed to submit to that leader? And who will I give an account for? The second part of the verse. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. If I find that someone from Good Shepherd's Church, I'm using that church because they're really close in proximity and share the same acronyms as us. But if someone were to sin from that church and to, you know, be, you know, do, do whatever, do I feel the responsibility to shepherd that child or that parent or that student? Well, obviously for us, the answer is no. You know, as, as Christians, we don't have this uh, universal Pope figure that we all somehow submit to. But the Bible says to us that we submit to our local church pastor. And when we have that idea of we submitting to a local church pastor, we have this understanding that there are people that belong to a local church. And so when we think about this idea of our submission to our local pastor, it reminds us that these uh, that we submit to our local pastor, the people of Good Stewards Church, and that us as pastors, we give an account for our local congregation. Now, those are the people that we are accountable for. And if you are a member here, those are the people that you submit and affirm their leadership to. Again, we refer back to the definition of church membership. Um, that was given in the beginning, that the members submit to the leaders that are on that church. And so we have some kind of form for local church, as well as this relationship between the pastor, as well as the members that are there, that there's this submission that goes on to your local church pastor, and there is the pastor who will give an account for the people, the members of of the local church. But there's also different reasons for us to see that we need a local church. We need to be church members. Because if you read through the New Testament, and I will flash a bunch of Bible verses for you guys on the screen right now. There are these verses, commands that God calls the one another verses. These are commands to love one another, serve one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens. And these verses are done inside of a local church. You cannot do these verses by yourself. You need a local church and people who are uh, members of that local church in order to practice and exercise to obey these things. You cannot love yourself. You cannot give to yourself. You cannot bear your burdens by yourself. These are things that we do one another. And I think in these verses, we come across a truth about Christianity that we are not just accountable for our discipline and our holy way of life. We are accountable for our brothers and sisters that are inside of the local church. We care for the physical and spiritual well-being of the relationship of the people that God has surrounded us with. We will not be measured by God simply because we checked off all the boxes of reading the Bible and praying every day and evangelizing on Sundays, going on mission trips and going to retreats. But if we see our brother and sister and we see that they're suffering, we're inside of this local church and we see a member that's not doing well, that may be in sin, and we do nothing because we are doing fine ourselves, then that is not just that person's bad or that person's problem or that person's sin. We become accountable for that person ourselves. Back in Cain and Abel, back all the way in Genesis, when Abel was murdered by Cain and God asked Cain, Where's your brother Abel? Cain responds back, am I my brother's keeper? 
Am I accountable to my brother? Do I have to watch over my brother? Oh, why don't you just ask me about my life, my discipline, my way of life? No, God says, you are accountable to your brother. And that is the same word that God gives to the members of the church. We are accountable to love one another, serve one another, all to meet with one another. Those are the things that we can only do when we know, uh, when we are inside of the local church. You know, recently, uh, these verses have had such a major impact in me with everything going on right now. Um, you know, like maybe some of you guys, you guys may not know uh, what the next step is um, towards loving uh, the people in the African-American community. And, you know, our church did something really cool recently where we interviewed uh three of our members or two of our members and one additional attender from our church who identify with the African-American community. And through this series, they shared just the different uh, struggles with racism that they had to endure and you know how everything that's going on is affecting them personally. Uh, we, we were able to ask them, hey, what are some ways that we could pray for you and be a church where you don't feel, uh, where you feel at home here, even though uh, you're the minority here. And, you know, these were, these were um, talks that they were able to give about how we could love them, serve them and bless them. And, you know, the confusing thing for me right now, and I'm speaking very personally, is I don't know what the next step is. You know, I don't know. Um, how to decipher what should be the Christian response towards everything that is going on. Of course, we call out injustice and we are so grieved by um, the different um, African-American uh, people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tamir Rice who died unjustly. And we cry out together with uh, the people, especially their family that are mourning right now through all the seasons of grief. And, you know, we're thinking like, well, what needs to be changed? What, what laws need to be changed? Or, you know, are these laws even, do they even need to be changed? Or, you know, what's being manipulated and, you know, what, what stats are being uh, used to prove their point? There's so many different talking points right now. And, you know, it's a little bit overbearing for me and I'm trying to decipher what's right and what's true. But I know the thing that I can do right now is not just to love people that I may or may not ever meet or, uh, love policies that may or may not need to be pushed. But God's given me the opportunity to love the people that are with me, to mourn with them as they go through their times of grief, to uh, pray for them in their times where they feel so helpless and powerless, and to give voice to them when they feel the need to speak up about injustice and pain that is personal to them. And so I don't have all the answers. And I, I have had the privilege of talking to a lot of you guys about what's been going on. But, you know, personally in my life, I've just been so blessed to just try to be a good church member and loving the people that God has given and placed in front of me. And so, yeah, I want to encourage you guys to do that too. So, yeah, being a member, you, you know who, who to pray for, who to love, who to uh, give your time to, the, your energy for, and to practice and to apply all those verses that we have over there. And so that's the biblical case for membership about identifying and being placed inside of a local church, not just being a consumer, but a committed part of that local church. But why should we be a member? And I have two points for us here today. Why should you be a member? Number one, for your spiritual growth. You know, being a consumer Christian where you're just kind of coming, passively listening and leaving will not grow your faith. Being a committed Christian will. Being a church member plugs you into a growing community who aren't just interested in filling a void in your life and giving you someone to talk to when you need to. No, they're accountable for so much more than that. They're accountable for your spiritual walk. They push you towards love and good works. They even are able to say hard things that you need to hear. And this relationship is not self-centered in just making you and I feel good about ourselves. This friendship that we have as church members is a missional friendship that we have where we're pushing together to glorify God together. It's the most transformative relationship that you and I can experience in this life. 
You know, I, I get to do some dating counseling here and there. I got to do premarital once in my life. And I'm so thankful that a lot of you guys uh, haven't seeked uh, dating advice from me. Um, you know, when I see you uh, and, you know, someone from the opposite gender message me uh, and they say, oh, we need to talk to Pastor Charlie, we want to talk to you. I die a little inside. You know, it makes me kind of uncomfortable. But uh, I, I still love it. I still want you to do that if you're, if you're dating someone inside of the church. But with that being said, when, when I go through dating counseling, there's automatic just red flags and just this alarm that goes off in my head. When I ask that person, hey, what do you like about the other person? And he or she responds, I like it that he or she doesn't try to change me. Like, that's what you like about that person, because that person likes me just the way that I am, thinks that I'm perfect, and that doesn't try to make me something that I'm not right now. But do you see kind of just the self-centeredness of that idea and thought? Oh, I don't need changing. I'm perfect the way I am. And if you were to speak into my life and show my flaws and say that I don't measure up or you're glaring at some of the things that I'm self-conscious about, that I don't need changing that, uh, yeah, that that's wrong. Don't speak into my life because I'm good right where I am. You know, that's already the, the, the makings of a bad relationship because the peace that you have is a superficial peace because once those ugly things in our lives actually surface, then we don't have words to be able to try to change that person. You know, guess what? We don't, you know, the person that's dating inside of a relationship, they're not the ones that just need change. Everyone needs to change. Everyone has blind spots. If we knew everything that was wrong with us, wouldn't we be the ones that tried to change? But a lot of the sins and a lot of our shortcomings manifest itself inside of our relationship. We're blind to it because we're used to it. We think about it or we try to minimize it and excuse it or psychologize it. But other people can see. You know, we need the church because we need to spiritually go and our spiritual growth cannot just come from us and God by ourselves, just reading the Bible and praying for ourselves. It's built up in community where people could see our shortcomings, our short temperness, our short sightedness, and they could speak the truth in love into our lives. There's nothing more transformative than good Christian friendships that are found within church members. I read a statistics from a sociologist, and I really like this. I think it's true that you and I are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. Now, think about your relationships, the five people that you spend the most time with. Isn't it true that you're the average of those five? I find that true for me. And so I want to give my time and my energy and my prayers to people that I want to run the race together with. You know, our relationships, our memberships are the laboratories that God uses for true Christian transformative change. And so we need to dedicate ourselves to a local church with real people. We can't just hop around because when we find true members that we could be accountable and transparent and loving that we know that they're not just going to cheer for us, but they're going to speak even hard things to us, man, those are the places where we're able to say, this is the area where I could change the most. Hey, we want to pursue good membership because we want true change. Secondly, we want to pursue membership, not just because we want spiritual growth, but because God loves the church. You know, we want to commit and love the local church. And God, when he sees the local church, he doesn't see a church building. God sees church members. And we want to love the church because God loves the church. Look with me at Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. In the book of Acts, it details the conversion of Paul, who was Saul in Acts chapter 9. And notice what Jesus says to him on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. And falling to the ground, Saul heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. If you guys know your Bible history, by this time, Jesus had already ascended into heaven. 
And during this time, Saul was a Jewish man persecuting Christians. And when Jesus confronts him on the road to Damascus, Jesus doesn't come down and say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting Christians? Why are you persecuting my friends? No, Jesus identifies with this church. Do you catch what he's saying in verse 4? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus so closely identifies with this church that he refers to the church in Damascus as me. I think that's where Paul gets the idea of writing in 1 Corinthians that the church is the body of Christ. Why does he love the church? Again, from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28. It says this, Acts 20, 28. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I, oh, I'm sorry, pay careful attention to yourselves, to all in the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Why do we love the church? Why should we be church members? Because God loves the church. Acts 20, 28 says that Jesus obtained the church. He paid for the church with his own blood. The church is an extra credit. It's not God's plan B. No, Jesus actively loved the church so much that it is his blood that he paid for the church. When you and I don't see the importance of church, we're looking at it from our world for we're not looking at it from God's. Because the church was so precious to God that he would spend his own son's blood in order to form the church, to shape the church, to build the church. Only through Jesus, because he would give his own life for the church. A church that he identifies so closely with. Why are you persecuting me? A church he's willing to spend his own blood for. The church is bought by the blood of Christ. And if this is how God sees the church, then how can we lessen what God thinks about the church? Membership makes this relationship, the love of God, visible. When we commit to the church, we are stating, Jesus loved me. And Jesus loves this church. And because Jesus loves this church, I too will commit, love, and dedicate myself to the church. If you are not a Christian here today, you may think, oh, I'm obligated to come to church or I attend church in order to gain salvation. No, the reason why we could be called members in the body of Christ is because Jesus himself has paid the price of our sins. We are brought into the family of God, not by our works or merit, but because Jesus shed his blood for us. This is amazing love that God has given to us. To be a part of his body, to be in part of the family of God, he has given us his church because Jesus would pay for it by his blood. And if you are not a Christian here today, you will find no other motivation to join or be a part of the church outside of that reason. And so you will not commit to the loving relationships that are inside of the church and you won't stick it out when church is hard or tough and there's fighting and bitterness and uh, all it feels so, um, you know, or the church could feel so just um, static and dry and boring. You won't stick it out for the hard times if you're not motivated because Jesus loved you. You're seeing from your worldview and your eyes and not Jesus's. And so if you're not a Christian here today, we want to invite you to this amazing love that Jesus has shed, has shed his own blood for you. And through that love, you can love his bride, the church. If you are a believer here today, I want to just encourage you with two things. If you're not baptized or confirmed, you should go ahead and do that. Membership is the visual represented, the representation that we have committed ourselves to a local church. But before you get plugged in as a member, you must be baptized or confirmed. Now, why is that important? Because we just covered the church is not a building, but a people whom Christ has shed his blood for. Now, how do we know who Christ has shed his blood for? For those who have shown to identify with him through baptism or confirmation. We can understand that this might be challenging for some of us. We don't want to speak out loud and uh, share about our personal lives. But 
for those who are Christian and just find that to be such a big obstacle to uh, share your testimony out loud. And I want to admit and say, man, it is a big obstacle. That's the number one fear in uh, America today. It's a uh, fear of uh, public speaking. There are other ways we could record you in advance or we could uh, have you type it out and someone else can read it. But whatever it is, you cannot say that uh, I, I'm going to push off my baptism and confirmation just because I don't want to uh, speak in public. Hey, if you are a believer here, I want to encourage you right now to be baptized or confirmed and to seek that out. If you don't know where you stand with God, you don't know whether you should get baptized or confirmed, this is a great opportunity to talk to your teachers, your leaders, or your pastor to ask them, hey, is this a good time for me to be baptized or confirmed? Church membership starts with baptism and confirmation, where you publicly declare that you have the shed blood of Christ upon you because of your sins and selfishness, you drifted away from God. And through baptism and confirmation, you show that that blood of Jesus Christ is upon you, that you are a member of the family of God, or I'm sorry, that you have given your life over to God. And membership is you joining and being a part of that family of God, living in a committed relationship with those that have confessed the same. So number one, think about your own baptism and confirmation. Secondly, I want to encourage you that attending church is not enough. In heaven, there is no perfect attendance award. No one will be uh, awarded and amazed. God will not be amazed that you went to church even in your mother's stomach. No, God will not care about your attendance at church, but whether you were committed at church. And so if you are a Christian here today, I want to encourage you that you are not silent during small groups. Our small groups, our large group, our discussion groups aren't just here like labs where just, where we're just theoretically talking about the sermon or the Christian life or just giving the right answers. This is our time to experience what church membership is going to feel like when we get older when we share prayer requests, where we seek to know God better, where we speak the truth in love to our brother or our sister in Christ that's struggling, where we pray for one another, love one another, give to one another. But I'm so sad that these instances of us being transparent, loving, sharing what's really inside of our hearts, we just leave it for retreats and we just keep it there. We just, seem, we just can't seem to bring what we do at retreats back down to here. I don't know why we give a lot of time for small groups, large groups, and discussion groups. And I think maybe we're so fixated on sharing the right answer. But we share the right answer sometimes to hide what we really feel inside of our hearts. We use that as kind of a shield just so that we could really hide just the real insecurities, fears, or just the real deep sadness that's inside of our heart. Hey, if you're a Christian here today, this is a great time for us to be open, to be vulnerable, and to practice being the church, not just attending church, but being the church together, loving one another, giving with one another, bearing one another's burden, serving one another, gathering together, spurring one another in one's love and good deeds. Hey, use this time to be able to do that. Again, I wanna end my address. I know I'm going a little long here today. To talking to you seniors specifically, and as you guys look for churches, hey, I want you to talk to your, uh, the leaders of that church, the pastors of that church, and ask them, hey, how do I become a member at this church? What does that look like? Are there classes that I need to take? Is there a covenant that I need to sign? What is in the covenant? What can I see? What do I agree with? What do I disagree with? Um, are there classes? What happens next? Can I even be a member in my college years? Um, and what's expected of me? Can I dedicate? Can I commit to that? And think about this as your pathway to growth. You know, a lot of us will just pick a church that speaks to us, that gives us the feels. And we choose a church for the moment but we don't reflect if that church is going to help us grow the four, five, hopefully not six years that we're off away in college. Hey, be picky about the church that you pick and make sure you understand and pick a church where as your senior year, right before you graduate, you can say, by my commitment and dedication to this church, I can see how I've grown. And the way that you and I can grow spiritually the most 
is by being an active member, not a consumer at the church. You know, a lot of us will choose to go to a mega church. And I don't have anything against the size of the church or the mega church, but a lot of the reasons what appeals to us about the mega church is it plays into this idea that we could just be consumers, passive observers to what the church is. And if there's a mega church, man, they have awesome praise music, they have full band, they have, you know, all the songs that, you know, we really like with high energy and professional musicians. If there's a mega church, there's not a Joe Schmo like me coming and speaking, but that person's probably funny, insightful, a uh, really great teacher of the Bible even for some of them. And yeah, they have the bells and whistles to make church really fun, exciting, and awesome an experience. And it can be, and it could be super fun and enriching. But if you're just a passive observer at these huge four or five, 6,000 people churches, then you will not grow. You'll be entertained. You may even get a little emotional. But unless it's really centered upon real, committed, authentic Christian relationships, then you're not going to grow. And so I want to really encourage you to think about your growth, not just for the moment, but for the four years that you're going to commit to this local church. Start researching churches right now. Think about the pastors or the leaders that are there. Think about what time their services are. Are you going to be able to wake up in time for the service? Do they have carpools available for college students like yourself? Um, are there different... Um, community groups, membership classes, or different Bible studies or Sunday schools that you could get plugged into that you really want to grow in. Start re researching right now. And, you know, this sounds really cheesy, but ask me for a letter of recommendation. I would love to give you a letter of recommendation for any church that you choose to go to or commit yourself to. I love to talk to your pastor, whoever he or she may be, and I would love to get to know them and speak on behalf of you and say, man, I, I would really appreciate you grow uh, one of my old students like this. And I hope that he or she is a wonderful, committed, uh, dedicated member of your church. And I'm here to fill in the gaps of how best he or she could serve your church. And I would love to do that for you guys to make sure that you fit into your church right away and you start the process of membership right away at a healthy local church. I want you guys to be able to start thinking right now and praying looking online for what a healthy local church in your area can be. Well, with that being said, church membership is essential. It's how you and I relate to the local church and how we relate to the members of that local church. And it's only through membership that we're able to have a healthy relationship, not just with the God that we believe, but with the people that God has created us to love and share life together with. Hope and pray that you pursue local, local church membership as you guys get older. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. And Lord, this word may not apply a lot to us. We come in as a seventh grader and church membership is the farthest thing in our mind. And yet, God, how essential that is for our growth when we graduate from youth ministry, from education ministry. God, we need to not just be passive consumers, of what we see here. This is not a show. We've covered last week that, God, this is where we can ascribe you glory, give you glory, worship you. And that is not a passive experience. It is active. And it is something that we do together in community. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us that kind of desire. First, show to us the love that Christ has shown to us. And if you loved and shed blood for the people that God are inside of this church, Father, help us to be able to love those that you have loved. Help us, oh God, to be a blessing and help us, Father, specifically for the seniors to pick good, healthy, faithful local churches that practice church membership. Thank you, Father. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys, and we hope that you uh, have a great discussion with your large group and small group and discussion groups about, hey, what church membership is and where you stand right now in terms of that. So, hey, God bless you guys, and have a great one. We get tired 
We can't win We were dead In our sin But there's a hope A new life The pressure's off Cause Jesus Christ alive So we can rejoice Though we're grieved by Various trials For a little while Cause a genuine faith Under testing Brings honor and glory To our great King By God's great mercy We have been born again Because Jesus Christ Is alive Our living hope is in our inheritance Because Jesus Christ is alive We don't have to bear the load We don't have to have control We are free from guilt and shame Cause when he rose, he left death in its grave So we can rejoice, though we're grieved by Various trials for a little while Cause a genuine faith under testing Brings honor and glory to our great King By God's great mercy, we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive Our living hope is in our inheritance Because Jesus Christ is alive No grip of fear, no sting in death By His mercy we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive grip of fear, no sting in death, because Jesus Christ is alive. We're free from guilt, we're free from shame, because Jesus Christ is alive. We're free to live for Jesus' fame, because Jesus Christ is alive. By God's great mercy, we have been born again. Jesus Christ is alive Our living hope is in our inheritance Because Jesus Christ is alive No grip of fear, no sting in death By His mercy we have been born again Because Jesus Christ is alive